Uh, anyway, we'd like to welcome you to the uh, uh, annual Jeannie Goddard Lecture. Uh, she's taught the children of most of the people in this room. Uh, I did a few, yes, yes. I got Tommy. Okay. Uh, this is uh, our story of our tour, and we hear informally that a few of you have taken it, a few of you are hoping to take it or looking forward to taking it. And we want to assure you that this is one of the most dynamic weeks you're going to spend if you take this tour. You can see the sites without the tour that, that we acknowledge, uh, but the, the, as we'll try to explain as we go, the, the tour itself uh, was uh, full day every day and uh, uh, a lot of emotional involvement as well. Yeah. Oh, it is such a joy. Can you hear me? Such a joy to see so many people that we know, and you know, also those of you who have just come. And this trip was on my personal bucket list for, for decades. And I taught a humanities class at Wellesley High, and we covered the civil rights period. So every year we would watch uh, part one of Eyes on the Prize, which I absolutely recommend that you watch. Uh, it was produced in Boston, and it covers the first, you know, the 60s, pretty much, the 50s and the 60s. It's brilliant, it's moving, it's amazing. And uh, so for us, it was the kind of experience that we had when we went to Normandy, which was another bucket list location. And when you go to Normandy, at, well, or before I say that, in all our travels, we've always found that there are sacred places in the world. And when you're in a sacred place, you, you feel it, you know it. And when you go to, how many of you have been to Normandy? Yeah, I'm sure. And when you stand there, whether it's in the summer or the fall or the spring, and you stand on the cliff overlooking Omaha Beach, and you look out, and for those of us of a certain age, we're uh, all of a certain I guess we're all of a certain age. <laughs> there, I see a few little young ones in here, but uh, you, you just imagine those boats coming in and those amazing people getting off those boats, running across the beach. I mean, I could practically weep right now, and scaling the, the cliffs and, and dying in droves. And, and we had this wonderful guide who was French, is French, and he said the reason that he is a guide at Normandy, the reason he does that work is because he can't imagine why so many American boys, 17, 18, 19, 20, would have left their homes and come to save his country. And, uh, you know, it, it really had a tremendous impact. And going on this civil rights trip, which we all remember uh, in our, you know, back in, starting really in the late 50s, with Emmett Till and moving through and all the um, horrible things that we saw on television. And, and we'll talk about a lot of that as we go. But just being able to be in those places, to be on the Pettus Bridge, uh, to be in the, the church in Birmingham where the little girls were killed, uh, and to walk through these parks where there were fire hoses and everybody. Uh, you know, and dogs and so forth. Because you're there, even though nothing is there, but you, you know it, you remember it, and you feel it. And the, uh, the museums that they have now just knock your socks off. I mean, really, you, you go in and you just absolutely 
cannot believe it, uh, you know, how the, the impact that they have. And I'll just mention one, even though it's sort of out of order. Um, there's one that is in Birmingham. It's uh, the Brian, Brian, have you heard of Brian Stevenson? Yeah, he, he's in Montgomery. It's Montgomery, I'm sorry. And uh, when you go in, he has this amazing uh, museum, and Brooks will talk about it a little bit, but when you walk in, it, it takes you through all the stages, the beginning of slavery, all the way you know, up to the incarceration of so many uh, uh, black males in particular uh, over the years. And you walk in and you are surrounded. It's an area maybe twice the size of this room. And when you step through the door, there's this huge screen and it's water. It's the ocean and you hear the waves. And I, I, I'm, I'm a seasick person. You know, so I almost had to go. I thought, oh my God. And uh, it's taking you into the boat where so many of the slaves came to, uh, you know, this part of the world. And, uh, and then you go through and, they, and there are so many other steps. But the kind of, talk about an immersive week, wouldn't you say, Brooksy? It's just, you're awash in emotion every every second of the day and you know the guilt the you know the uh, all sorts of feelings that, that you have and uh, they just do an amazing job of channeling all the experiences that you're going to see and, and giving you background and connecting you with people who who were there you know who uh, you know people little girls who are now our age who ran across the children's, uh, you know, in the children's march. When, and so we'll tell you that story in a bit. Go ahead, Brixie. Okay, so what, what I thought I'd, I'd, I'd say is what we do have, and you're welcome afterwards to take a peek. Uh, we have behind me on the piano uh, a, a variety of, of, of books. And here are the uh, museum books for uh, Montgomery. And here are the reports that Equal Justice Initiative has produced, and more about that. And then here are the books about John Lewis uh, called March, book one, two, and, and three. And they're graphic novels, and they'd be great for grandchildren, or uh, you know, they're great for us. I mean, they're, they're really quite, quite powerful, for sure. Okay. Then you, you've been given a handout. I mean, what's class without a handout? Huh? <laughs> and uh, these are the chief civil rights dates on page one. Uh, you have a sample, if, you have a sample registration questionnaire on page two, or do you not? Yeah. Okay. Let's just look at that for a second. Yeah. While we're at it. Right. Um, <laughs> uh, no. Oh, go ahead. No, no, no. It's okay. Um, and so, and you can imagine yourself. You have gone down to the registry, and you, you know, you go to town hall, and you want to vote. And it takes and you two seconds. To now you got to answer right. these questions. How many seeds are in a watermelon? Uh, if a person charged with treason denied their guilt, how many persons must testify against them before they can be convicted? Uh, how many bubbles in a bar of soap? How many jelly beans in the jar? All, all these ridiculous questions. And so that scores and scores of people were denied the right to vote until, uh, you know, LBJ was able to pass and, and the 1965. Coming back, in case you haven't noticed. Okay, then the next page are uh, one of Jeannie's favorite words, sundries. Uh, civil rights sundries, quotations, and a picture of a uh, sign. And the last page, uh, should you have nothing else to do tonight or the <laughs> ensuing days, uh, you can look at these videos. Uh, which replicate 
the events uh, held in those particular towns. Yeah. And one of the things that was jolting for a person like myself, who grew up in Needham, actually, uh, was to hear of how, how uh, really involved, deeply involved, the Boston area was with the slave trade. And uh, Fannel Hall, you know, Mr. Fannel, you know, all kinds of uh, money with the slave trade. You hear about Harvard, you, you know, all, many of the people have given buildings and, uh, and Rhode Island was big, Bristol. Uh, and, I, you know, because I've always felt, not, not recently, but for most of my life, I think I felt superior as a northerner that somehow or other, you know, we didn't do stuff like that. And that's absolutely untrue. And so that was something that was important for us to, to get over. Uh, on the uh, whiteboard up here, you can, you can see some of the outlines. Uh, this was a one week, uh, uh, eight day technically, Sunday to Sunday. It fits in perfectly, you fly into Atlanta, you fly out of Atlanta. Uh, then Sunday after Sunday late afternoon, there's a gathering of the people, and then there's a meal, and then there's an explanation of the drill. And the drill is pretty much the same every day. You're going to have breakfast with the group. There's going to be an introductory talk of some kind. Then there's going to be a series of activities interspersed with lunch and then dinner. And at the end of dinner, you go back to your room and get ready for the next day. And cry. <laughs> yeah, that, that, so that's easy the first couple of days. Yeah. But then after, as, it, as the momentum of the things build up, it becomes increasingly trying. Yeah. So uh, Sunday night, we're in Atlanta. Monday night, we're in Atlanta. And Tuesday night, we're in Atlanta. And then we get on the bus. Well, we've been on the bus all those days. And there's something wonderfully appropriate about, being, about traveling around on a civil rights tour on a bus. Yeah. Now, it has all kinds of practical applications. But the symbolism, I thought, was really powerful. Yeah. And that's why we titled this, you know, what, what did we title this? I don't know. Something about the bus and Miss Rosa, all right? Yeah. So obviously, mo of all those events, most of us understand Rosa Parks. Yeah. And then we go the next day. The, the, so then on uh, Wednesday, we leave for Montgomery, and we're two nights in Montgomery, Alabama. Now, I had never stepped foot in the state of Alabama, all right? Yeah. But it was an eye-opener. Yeah. And actually, I really got to like Montgomery. And then two nights there, and then the next, then following day, on to Birmingham via Selma. Yeah. Now, Selma is a special yeah. place. And then Birmingham for two nights. And then bus back to Atlanta, and you're, you're ready for more than just a lie down. Yeah. Okay? Yeah. And, and I do want to say, any of you who want to, you know, shriek out with a comment or a memory or a question or anything, please. Yes, yay. Oh, it's the um, it's Rhodes, Rhodes Scholar. Rhodes Scholar. Yeah. R-O-A-D, yeah. 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 And they do a number, I mean, there are more, more trips by other organizations that I'm sure are equally, equally terrific. But this just happened to be the one that we did and we took. And some of the other trips will go up to, um, will go into Mississippi as well. And uh, so. But what was valuable about this kind of planning <clears throat> was that every minute was filled. We had, we happened, we, you have a group leader, in our case, this fantastic woman who'd had some teaching experience herself and very knowledgeable. Uh, and then as we went from place to place, somebody would show up that knew a whole lot that we needed to know. Yeah. And yeah. that was helpful as well. Absolutely. 
And uh, just a minute. Yes. yes. Oh, please. Oh, hi. Hi. Yes. Um, so hi. How are you, Pat? Yeah. Hey, I just wanted to tell you. Okay. You're, um, you're a student, and my son. And I wanted to ask you, would this be appropriate for your kids? No. Well, it depends on the age. I mean, I think high school, uh, high school kids for sure. But I, I, I don't think you'd necessarily want to take a, a six-year-old, you know? But I mean, when, when they get to high school, I mean, they live in Atlanta, and so they have been to some of the places here in Atlanta. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yes. or maybe, I, I know the middle school did a trip uh, years back. They, they went down to the south. And uh, I don't know if they, I don't think these museums that are so evocative and powerful, I don't think they existed then. And because I think, uh, now, you know, the embrace in uh, the Martin Luther King Coretta mm -hmm. sculpture in uh, Boston, uh, the people who did the installation of that sculpture is a Boston company and an amazing, oh gosh, I'm going to look, I'll, I'll look it up uh, before long, and a wonderful Wellesley woman actually works, uh, works with them, she's an architect, and they did what they call the lynching museum, which, which is one of the most terrifying outdoor experiences that I've ever had. I mean, if you probably most of you have been to DC and have seen the Vietnam War Memorial, or the Holocaust. and uh, but but the as an outdoor sculpture, and it's tremendously powerful. I mean, you know, I lost high school friends, and uh, I. I go down there, you do the names, and you touch, and you feel. And th this lynching museum is like the Vietnam War Memorial on steroids. Hmm? No. 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 Well, you've been. Yeah. And, and so you can help us. So you, you go to this museum, and <clears throat> it's all outdoors, and you walk up a hill into this gigantic cavernous building but it's outdoors there aren't doors and hanging appropriately from the ceiling are these giant uh, coffin like uh, rectangles. rectangles and on each rectangle is a particular county in the south and it has all the names of the people who were lynched and uh, I remember at one point, and they have guides at, or guards or people throughout, docents, I suppose. And I went to one, and I saw about 25 names. And I turned to this woman. I said, oh, my God, all in one county. And she said, come over here. She took me to another one, and there were 239 people. And... Uh, and, and you just wander, I'm just on, right? minute, sweetie, wander down, you know, the, uh, I don't know, ramps, and they're just more and more and more. Chuck. Yeah, okay, they. Let, let me address that. Yeah, I, I think it's four. Oh, well, they're, they're, they're 4,000 plus with this museum. But each one of those, pardon? I don't, I don't know. Okay. Each one of those is double documented, has two documented references. So in order to, to qualify, there has to be documentation. The speculation, of course, is that it's at least double that amount, if, yeah. if, uh, yeah. if not more. And the last one, the most recent one, was 1963, which gives you, you know, a bit of a, a, a jolt. And if you look on the third page of your handout, this uh, Toni Morrison quotation from Beloved is, um, uh, you see that as you go in, and then you see it as you go out. And I'm just going to read it to you. It's just such a powerful, 
I need my glasses. Uh, and O oh, my people out yonder, hear me. They do not love your neck unnoosed and straight. So love your neck. Put a hand on it. Grace it. Stroke it. Hold it up. And all your inside parts that they just as soon slop for hogs, you've got to love that. The dark, dark liver. Love it. Love it. And the beat and beating heart. Love that too. More than your life, more than eyes or feet, more than lungs that have yet to draw free air, more than your life, holding womb and your life-giving private parts, hear me now. Love your heart, for this is the prize. And so when you come down from that, it's up on a hill, and when you come down and you see this quotation, and there are a number of sculptures as well. Uh, you know, you just, it, it, that's when you need the lie down, you know, and it's, it's but yet there's a, uh, I guess, a grace to it all, and uh, either Brooks or I, I can't remember, one of us spoke to one of these people who works there and is in the uh, structure all day, and said, you know, how, how do you do it? How do you stay there? And this woman said, on my third day, a woman came up to me and hugged me and said, I have wanted to know what happened to my grandfather for decades, and I found his name here. And I am so, I'm just so glad to know what happened to him, because he had disappeared. And so she said, that's why I feel it's important for people to come and to see. Because you say to yourself, is, is this just sort of self-flagellation that you go to a museum like this? But it, it, there's significance and there's, there's knowledge and, uh, as, I, as I said, a kind of grace uh, that you, p these people have been acknowledged. Yeah. Okay, now we've kind of blown apart our <laughs> lesson plan. It's always my fault. Uh, <laughs> but, so I did want to remind you that we started in Atlanta, and Atlanta in many ways is a very comfortable place to start. Because first of all, you might have already been there, uh, second of all, uh, there's the Jim, you go see the Jimmy Carter Center, which isn't about oh. uh, civil rights per se, although as we think back on it, one of the Carter's greatest contributions to humanity has been the supervision of international voting. So that there, there's that still, there's that, Constant, one of the constant refrains uh, in, uh, in the trip was voting because most of the civil rights activity was to ensure that everybody could vote. Yeah. And as you know from the local rhetoric, it's still the essence. It's still, you know, <laughs> I'm sure. Yeah, go ahead. I'm sure. <laughs> uh, I, I am sure you're going to tell your grandchildren or great grandchildren to vote. God damn it! Yeah. All right. Yeah. Absolutely. So, 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 so Atlanta is a gentle start, and then we do get to Montgomery, and that's really the heart of the trip. And it's the heart of the trip because of Brian, <clears throat> of Brian Stevenson. And Brian Stevenson is a middle-aged black man lawyer who started off wanting to re-examine the incarcerated people who were on death row. And he has worked at this and worked at this and worked at this. And he has stayed in Montgomery. And he obviously has attracted a lot of following because these museums are not cheap, you can just see that. Yeah. But they're spectacular, and that's really more important than whatever they, they might, have, might have cost. And his movie, you might have seen his movie about the, 
oh, somebody help me with the title. Just Mercy. Just Mercy, yeah. And it's and the book is even better than the movie, yeah. But the movie is it has a power for for sure. And uh, all through, as Brooks talked about the um, the buses, and maybe those are our first memories of the busing and how uh, the freedom rides and how people from all over the country would go to the South, get on these buses, and try to ride them through the segregated South. And the buses, Greyhound, Mr. Greyhound, they call him, uh, they were all supposed to be uh, integrated. But of course, they were not. And the amazing... Uh, they go they were supposed to be integrated because there was a federal law that yeah, said yeah, they yeah. had to be. And they were initially planning to go, the, all the buses to go from Washington, D.C. to New Orleans. Yeah. And nobody ever made it to New Orleans. Right. And one of the things that for me personally was really a thrill is a, because I have always been a fan of a woman named Diane Nash who was essential to the busing movement. And uh, there are so few women in the civil rights movement who were really uh, you know, lauded and recognized. And this Diane Nash was something amazing. And in uh, 1961, when they were taking these trips and people were beaten up, there was a, a James Reeb, uh, who, uh, a Boston minister, a lot of ministers and rabbis and priests would go down and ride on these buses. And, uh, and it was really scary, scary, scary. And there, was, there were bombings, there were all kinds of things. And Kennedy was just frantic that something terrible was happening. He didn't have a great early civil rights record. He just wanted everything to be quiet and you know, not make noise and all that. But these, these kids, these were kids. 19, 20, they were children, really. And they got on these buses. And there was an encounter. There was something really bad and, uh, that had happened, uh, some kind of bombing. And uh, they had just barely escaped death, uh, this one whole bus. And Kennedy sent John Thig uh, Sigenthaler, who was about 6'8", one of his people. And Bobby Kennedy was the attorney general. And they sent him down. And they said, please tell these kids it's over. You're going to fly them home. They are not going to be allowed to go on because they could die. And there is a very famous encounter between Diane Nash, who was, I think, 20 at the time, this beautiful, beautiful college girl. And she's looking up at Siegenthaler. And she said, because she said, you, you, I don't think you know that you could die. And she said, every single one of us on this bus has written a will. We know that we could die. And we are not going to stop. And so Sigenthaler, you know, called Kennedy and he said, oh, you know, I just can't make them stop. And ultimately, they never made it to New Orleans, but they got further along. And uh, somehow or other, they agreed to stop. Uh, and, but I, it was just one of these classic confrontational moments between the young, whom I've always, you know, having spent my life teaching high school, I mean, what would we do without these young people, you know, who are willing to, you know, throw themselves into the abyss, you know, to change, to make change that they believe in is, is essential. And so it was that kind of event is so inspiring. And you'll see those events if you have a chance to uh, watch um, Eyes on the Prize. And you'll see the Siegenthaler. He gets, 
somebody hits him with a brick later on. And, you know, uh, so Kennedy finally thought, oh, my God, this is for real. And he got on, he, you know, and all the things that were happening with the hoses and, uh, you know, the, sh oh, am I jumping too, too quickly? But anyway, so, but Kennedy did come around ultimately and uh, speak to the nation and say, you know, we've got to allow these buses to be. I think that was what made them stop, is that, uh, you know, they had protection all the way along. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but while we're in Montgomery, I, I do want to stop and, <clears throat> and, and look at the individual uh, museums that Equal, Equal Justice Initiative has created. So the first... There's a thing to turn over. The first, the first one is called the Legacy Museum. And what is fascinating about the Legacy Museum is that it is a joint venture, un, 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 unintentionally, a, here it is, uh, a joint venture with a Ghanaian sculptor, yeah. activist, who in Ghana, is trying to document the departure of many of these people. Now, strictly speaking, most of the blacks brought to North America, and certainly to what the United States, were not from Ghana. Most of them were from Angola, all right? No matter, the dynamic is the same. And in this book, you will see some of the sculptures that he created. This is the walkway that you have to go down to get into the museum after you have been in that room with the crashing water. Sorry. You have to walk, you have to walk through there to get to the museum. So you're going to walk through there because without without it you can't get to the museum. Right. And look what you see. Yeah. Can you hold there? Sure. So that that's one of the more powerful things. And then you go inside and you go through the various stages of black experience in the United States. So, all right. Once you, you, there's a, a a bit on the slave trade. Then there's Reconstruction. Now, if you are, if you haven't studied Reconstruction, I recommend it to you. It's it's a, a very uncomfortable 13, 14 years in our history, but it's also the the I regret to say the foundation of the circumstances we find ourselves in now. Uh, the then Jim, the Jim the Jim Crow laws were pretty much. Yeah, so, and then we get to uh, the segregation and then to incarceration. So you might wonder about incarceration. It happens to be, as, as I think I've said before, a special um, a mission of Stevenson's, and uh, it is still part of the problem that is the, num the percentage of the black male population in prison is beyond higher than the similar percentage of other ethnic groups in the United States. And then there's, um, <clears throat> in one of the museums we went to, uh, there's uh, a lunch counter, because of course a lot of our memories are connected with people going into Woolworths and being you know, beaten from behind, and they would practice, they would study, and how to uh, you know, just remain Pacifist, which of course was Martin Luther King's watchword, that the only way we can really make progress is to, uh, you know, just kind of give our bodies to this thing and not fight back, and hope that ultimately it will shame people into change. And I, I just, just because uh, Martin Luther King was deeply affected by Gandhi in India and. If you've seen the, the movie Gandhi, you know, way back, there's a, 
a scene uh, when they're on a march, it's the Salt March, march, and they're marching and marching, and the British soldiers are lined up on horses, and as each line steps forward, they're beaten, and they have people who drag them off to the side, then the next line comes, and it keeps happening and happening until ultimately they can't beat them anymore. They, they can't. They, they had, a, you know, the British ultimately had a conscience and they thought we can't do this anymore. And so I think that was the inspiration for uh, these lunch counters and the, the buses and, and the complete nonviolence that was the watchword of the civil rights movement. And tell them about when you sat at the, at the one, the... Uh, there, there, there are only uh, three places at the lunch counter where you uh, in this display, and uh, so you you sit on a chair, obviously, and you see in front of you two circles with hands inside, hand shapes inside. So you put your hands on their hands, and then when the person sees that all three people have their hands in place, she flips the switch. You're, you're wearing uh, headphones. So what happens is all the sounds, nasty things said to people come through the headsets. You got slight little uh, shocks in your hands and the stools start to move, you know? So you're saying, oh my God. So just, just surviving that, let alone surviving that and trying to maintain a certain focus uh, would be very difficult. So we've kind of talked about what is called the Hanging Museum. It is uh, very, very uh, powerful. And this third museum, which we personally did not see because we were there, we were there in September and it opened the following February. So this is what they call the Sculpture Museum, but it is in part, a rep has two slave cabins, that's this is where people lived 24 seven. And, and there are various other aspects of sculpture throughout the park, leading us to understand that, and some of us already know this, that art is a very powerful conveyor of meaning. And uh, it, it's, uh, it's on the Alabama, Alabama River. It uh, is in part a very tranquil setting for a very horrible uh, action. Yeah. And uh, in Montgomery, a place that I had long wanted to visit, is uh, there's a civil rights memorial done by Maya Lin, who had done the Vietnam War Memorial. And do you remember Charles Kuralt? Yeah, from back in the day. And he went down and I taped it and used to show it in Humanities every year. And she had been asked to create something. And she thought, oh, you know, how, how can I memorialize all of these people who have died? And she used as her text the, um, let me find it, when justice rolls down like water, righteousness like a mighty stream, which is from the book of Amos. And uh, so there's this huge marble slab that has the quotation. And then there's this huge round marble flat, it's flat, and it's on a, a pedestal. And there's a fountain that comes up in the middle. And all of the people who were killed during the civil rights period, uh, and some people we never heard of, you know, they, but remember the, th the three civil rights workers, who were killed, James Reeve, you had Viola Liuzzo, who was driving people, this wonderful Italian woman. And uh, so all of their names were carved into this, on top of this round space. And the water came up from the middle and 
came out and went down. And so she saw it as a, as a, a cleansing. And she wanted people to put their hands onto the names. And in the Charles Corral piece, uh, they, he's there for the opening. And there's this one extraordinary moment that he filmed where this guy has his hands, he's got his two kids. They're, I don't know, 12, 14. And he's touching this hand. And he says to them, uh, oh, your granddaddy killed this guy. And, you know, I thought, oh, my gosh. But in a way, how, how wonderful that that had happened, uh, that, that encounter with the name that, and clearly he wasn't saying, yay, you know, this guy, you know, oh, our family's responsible. I mean, it was, there was a sweetness and a sadness uh, to it. And so that's a lovely little spot that, for me, had tremendous impact. And that's in Montgomery. Okay, so after you leave Montgomery, you go to Selma, which is about 60 miles away. Now, why was Selma, why was Selma important? Selma was important because someone realized that Lowne County had the fewest registered blacks of any county in Alabama. So they said, well, we'll go to Selma, we'll have a gathering and some speeches, and then we're going to walk to Montgomery to the governor's, uh, the governor's office and present him with a uh, request, uh, or yeah, request that voting be made easy in that county and all throughout Alabama. So everybody was saying, well, this is great. We'll get Martin Luther King. We'll get da, 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 da. Okay, and they all get together, and this is where, and, and John Lewis has left his association with SNCC, or one of those organizations that didn't want anybody getting political. And he goes, and he somehow he ends up in the front of the march, and they start walking over that bridge. Now, if you remember, they got up on top of the bridge all right. And then, from the other side of the bridge, come police and all kinds of officers with all kinds of batons, with horses, and that's the first use of the fire hoses. And so they're all, they're beaten back. Short story later, a short story, they, four days later, they regroup, they walk to, to Montgomery, they don't get any better result, but they do present their petition uh, to, uh, to George Wallace. And George Wallace, independent of this tour idea, has his own unique history in race relations in the United States. And you can Google George Wallace if you want to get some more of that. Yeah. And uh, we were just delighted to hear from one of the uh, people, who, uh, a woman who had been a child during these Selma marches. And she had told her mother, had lied to her mother, uh, I don't know whether she was about 12, and she, because her mother said, no, I don't want you connected with any of this. It's dangerous. Something could happen to you. But she and her little brother decided they would participate. And so they, and she knew she'd get in big trouble. But they thought, well, we'll be way in the back. And so they <laughs> were way in the back. And Until as, they were way in the front. And yeah. no, no, well, and, and so what happened is they start, you, you've all seen the films, I'm sure, of, you know, the horses coming and, you know, the beating of John Lewis and people falling and the horses kept coming through the whole people. And they ultimately, you know, this little girl and her brother, they ultimately thought, oh, my, you know, oh, this is not looking good. We better get out of here. And so they were trying to run to a church 
where, that, where a lot of the meetings had taken place. And so they took off, but as they took off, they heard the horses behind them coming, you know, uh, chasing them. And they were, and as soon as I got to the steps of the, whor of the church, she thought, oh, phew, it's going to be OK. But the horses started coming up the steps. <laughs> but they made it inside. And then she had to, so they survived, obviously. But then she had to tell her mother, who was not, not happy, happy no. not happy at all. And, but she said she remembers to this day with great pride that they had been you know, part of this march. And for the second march in Selma, tons and tons of people came down to participate in yeah, the march. And, and there were three camping grounds along, yeah. along the way. And can I tell my Needham story? I think you should. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I do have a personal uh, Selma story. I was in, it was 1965, and I was a junior at Simmons College in Boston. And I desperately wanted to go down. But I didn't, I was you know, a scholarship student working. I, I just couldn't, I just didn't have the money. I couldn't take the time. But I wanted to do something. So two of my high school classmates, one who was a student at Wellesley College and one at Harvard College, the three of us decided we would try to do something about fair housing in Needham. Because at the time, it was very difficult for any black person, very difficult for Jews as well, to buy houses in Needham. And what would happen is people would come and they'd check out your last name or your color, and they'd say, oh, you know, it just sold. I just made an agreement. And so we knew it was terrible what was happening in our town. So, uh, I wrote a letter, and uh, we s mimeographed it with those old mimeographs that go through, you know, the, and they're just a mess. <laughs> and we sent it to as many different colleges as we could, where we th knew somebody from Needham High was a student, and said, please pass around and see if these people will sign that they agree that there should be fair housing in Needham and that the, you know, the selectmen should pass a, you know, an ordinance or whatever. And so we, you know, I was getting all of these signatures and it was so thrilling and exciting. And <clears throat> a girl who was at UMass, her father was a reporter for the Boston Globe. And he heard about it and he thought, oh, I'm gonna interview these three kids. And so he called me at my dorm, and I thought, oh, you know, fame, you know, glory. And he came over, and he interviewed my, my friend Colette at Harvard and my friend Eric at Harvard. And we gave, we coughed up to this reporter. He asked us our parents' names and our addresses. So I had no... I mean, we weren't savvy in any way. <coughs> and so the next day, <coughs> sorry, uh, the Globe comes out, and there are three lead stories. One is about Selma. One is, a, is about something happening in the city in Boston. And the third column in the middle was called The Kids. And that was about us and what we were trying to do. So, you know, my professors were all patting me on the head saying, oh, Jeannie, you're a good girl, and this is nice. You're, you know, speaking out, and good to be an activist. And so that night, I got a call from my mother. She had been, the phone had never stopped ringing with all of these hate calls all night long. And uh, then the, the letters started coming and uh, threats. And uh, I still have a couple of the letters. And uh, just terrible, vicious things said to me and to my parents and, 
And our neighbor, who lived across the street, whom I'd known since I was four, he didn't speak to me for 20 years. And he, uh, my mother and his wife had been, you know, best friends. Uh, he wouldn't give us a mortgage for our house, <laughs> you know, much later. And uh, he called the police chief and asked the police chief uh, to kind of, you know, watch me every time I came home. And it was very scary. And <clears throat> uh, yeah, I'll finish it up, sorry. Uh, and so then, you know, people started saying, you know, getting nervous. Some of the people who had um, signed the letter. And I took it to the newspaper, be like the Wellesley Townsman. Uh, it was the Needham Times. And the guy said, I'm not putting that in. I said, but we're citizens, you know, hello. Uh, and uh, he said, no, if you want this in the newspaper, it has to be a, an ad. And the ads cost huge amounts of money. And so I had to then write to everybody, see if they would send in a dollar. And so we could pay. And we didn't, of course, get anywhere near the amount of money. And there was a, a, an amazing woman, Dr. Dorothea Wilgoose, who was one of the first doctors, uh, women to go to Harvard Law, uh, Med. She lived in town. She called me at school and she said, Jeannie, I'm paying for the whole thing. And we'll have a full page ad. And so I have loved her all my life. She lives, uh, used to live on Great Plain. I, you know, I sort of shed a tear when I go by her house. But it, it was uh, just an eye-opener to me to think that my little Needham town uh, would have such deep roots of prejudice and, uh, and, and racism. Anyway. OK, so we're going to finish up in Birmingham. And uh, Birmingham has two famous elements. One is what was called the Children's March on the public park in May of 1963. And then the more famous event, which we just saw, which was just happened, the, the anniversary of which was just passed, was the bombing at the 16th Street Baptist Church. And when we started to do this, we tried to find some way to capture the visceral quality of those two events, because they take place in the same spot. Uh, the church is on the immediate edge of the park, and the kids were uh, hosed in the middle of the park. This was Bull Connor, remember Bull Connor? Just take one, yeah. just take and one. You, uh, before you show it, you walk through the park, and again, these sacred spaces, a concept that we feel so strongly about. This is one, this park, and you have to walk between these two sculptures, this one sculpture, and it's of the, of the dogs. And in order to get to the other side, you have to, you have to walk in between these dogs. Now, this I do have it up, right, yeah, yeah. But I can't tell you. you know, I think you'll see, Kathy, if anyone who's been, you know, if you feel the fear of, uh, so it's almost, it's not, it's, it's very difficult to walk between these three dogs, uh, apart from them being real. And it, it, does, it does capture, I think, very well the, uh, the, the, the horrible feeling that those kids must have felt when uh, they, they, were, they were attacked. So to, to kind of wrap up, what, what the tour then does is it takes you on the last night in Birmingham, we're back at the hotel and we have a summary kind of wrap up of, uh, of the events of the week. Uh, she tells us that logistically the bus is leaving at seven in the morning. It's going directly to the Atlanta airport 
and then we'll go to the hotel where we had stayed uh, at the beginning uh, of, of the week. <clears throat> so that's indeed what we get, and we kind of stumble off the bus uh, in a, at the Atlanta airport and fly home and yeah. take a rest. And uh, she did say that there were sort of three parts of the trip, discovery, reflection, and then activism, which would come, of course, after, after the trip. But a very, uh, <clears throat> just a, an amazing event, you know, a series of events for us. And we thought we'd uh, just end with a little, Come round by my side and I'll sing you a song. I'll sing it so softly it'll do no one wrong. On morning and Sunday the blood ran like wine and the choir kept singing of freedom That cold autumn morning No eyes saw the sun And that in May Collins Her number was one In an old Baptist church There was no need to run And the choir kept singing of freedom The clouds they were dark and the autumn wind blew and Dennis McNair brought the number to two The falcon of death was a creature they knew and the choir kept singing of freedom The church, it was crowded and no one could see That Cynthia Wellesley's dark number was three Her prayers and her feelings would shame you and me And the choir kept singing of freedom Young Carol Robertson entered the door And the number her killers had given was four She asked for a blessing but asked for no more And the choir kept singing of freedom I shook the ground And people all over the earth turned around For no one recalled a more cowardly sound And the choir kept singing of freedom They once asked of me How many blackberries Grow in the blue sea I asked them right back With a tear in my eye How many dark ships In the forest The Sunday has come Sunday has gone And I can't do much more Than to sing you a song I'll sing it so softly You know I'm wrong And the choir keeps singing Of freedom
Joni. She can still sing. <laughs> but, you know, the way it ends, how it was heard all around, you know, that there were these moments uh, that did make people sit up and, and listen and think and change. And certainly Emmett Till, Mrs. Uh, Mabel Till, who <clears throat> allowed her son to be photographed, this was in the late 50s, and put on the cover of a magazine. And <clears throat> no one could believe that she would allow this to happen. And people were shocked. I mean, the, uh, and the footage, the, these incredibly brave journalists and camera people who went down and filmed all of the stuff happening, uh, that, it, there had to be change. And if any of you are reading or have read the Doris Kearns Goodwin book, uh, An Unfinished Love Story, she writes about her husband, Dick Goodwin, who was a speechwriter for Kennedy and for LBJ. And he wrote the famous speech in 1965 for the Voting Act, because JFK couldn't get, he didn't get any of the legislation through, but LBJ, who knew how to twist arms, did. And uh, the end of the speech is, uh, we shall overcome. And Martin Luther King, listening to the speech, wept when he heard Johnson, a Southerner, say those, those words. And so, you know, there's lots left to do to make our life, uh, our world a more just place. But, uh, you know, I think you have to hope. You have to hope. And I, I believe in the, the children. That's what, I'm, that's what I'm hoping. So thank you so much for coming. <clears throat> Are there any questions or? They, they can ask as, as some people may want to leave. Oh, yeah, because uh, I know we're supposed to be done in an hour. Anybody have any questions or anything? Well, yes, Leslie. I don't have a question, but I just finished a just fantastic biography of Frederick Douglass. Oh, yes. And I believe the author is correct, B R I G H T. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. And Frederick Douglass, talk about a person who was essential to uh, everything that started in the 19th century. Uh, the Reconstruction was so important. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Anything else, anybody? No. Yes. I have a little suggestion also, okay. But I'm reading now, On Freedom by Timothy Snyder. I don't know who knows that. Yes, yeah. But a Yale historian, and it just came out in September 7th. Highly recommend it. Okay. Right. Wonderful. Thank you, Pat. All right. So have a, a lovely afternoon. Think, well. think positive thoughts. I hope we weren't a total downer for you. <laughs> I'm a dumb immigrant. I came here to, to hear about Rhoda Parks. Oh. Thank you.